Nalanda University, Plundered by Islamic Invaders and Crippled by Marxists. Written by Rakesh Krishnan Simha. Nalanda University has the unfortunate distinction of being destroyed twice. In the 12th century, the university faced wanton destruction by the Islamic invader Muhammad Bakhtiar Kilji. Its towering nine-story library, containing nine million priceless books and manuscripts, was burnt down, and many scholars, including hundreds of Buddhist monks, were slaughtered. This event is regarded as one of the most horrific instances of cultural vandalism in Indian history. Nalanda suffered a second crippling blow in the 21st century at the hands of a cabal of avaricious Marxists led by the economist Amartya Senator the Indian government revived the university in 2010 with a budget of more than 2,000 rupees crore, approximate 250 million US dollars, via the Nalanda University Act. The project was the brainchild of former President APJ Abdul Kalam and was endorsed by the 16-nation East Asia Summit. The government appointed Sen as the chairman of the Nalanda Mentor Group, NMG, and chancellor of the university with an unheard of basic salary of 80,000 US dollars per year. Despite drawing a fat salary, Sen remains the only Bharat Ratna awardee to avail of Air India's free travel offer, traveling 21 times between 2015 and 2019. The project was a disaster, with the Marxist academics on the university's governing board accused of mismanagement and financial fraud. Progress was so slow that academic courses commenced only in 2014, four years after launch. So, on June 19, 2024, when Prime Minister Narendra Modi inaugurated the new campus of the university in Rajgir, Bihar, and commented that Nalanda's shutdown pushed India into darkness, he could have just as easily been commenting on the shenanigans of Sen and his Marxist freeloaders. Riddled with controversies Over the years, the government's narrative, notably the Ministry of External Affairs, MEA, responsible for Nalanda University, suggests that Sen presided over a non-transparent institution with lax fiscal oversight and limited managerial competence. Leaked internal government communications and reports from the Comptroller and Auditor General have criticized the university for excessive tax-free salaries, unauthorized foreign trips, meetings held in luxury accommodations, and opaque appointment practices. The Comptroller and Auditor General of India, CAG, highlighted his extravagant spending and controversial appointments, which were criticized by President Kalam. In a letter dated July 4, 2011, to the Minister of External Affairs, S. M. Krishna, he wrote. Having been involved in various academic and administrative proceedings of Nalanda University since August 2007, I believe that the candidates to be selected slash appointed to the post of Chancellor and Vice-Chancellor should be of extraordinary intellect with academic and management expertise. Both the Chancellor and Vice-Chancellor have to personally involve themselves full-time in Bihar so that a robust and strong international institution is built. Kalam was clearly hinting at how Sen was populating Nalanda with his sidekicks and political appointees. Sample this. Gopa Subarwal, an ordinary reader in the Department of Sociology at Lady Sriram College. She had no knowledge of Buddhist studies for which the university was established. Apinder Singh, Daman Singh, Amrit Singh, all three are daughters of the then Prime Minister Manmohan Singh, and two of them continued their stay in the U.S. while drawing salaries from Nalanda University. Anjana Sharma and Nayanjot Lahiri, both friends of Gopa Subarwal and Napinder Singh. Also, Kalam's remark that both the Chancellor and Vice-Chancellor work full-time in Bihar alluded to some holding meetings of the NMG in cities like New York, Delhi, Tokyo, and Singapore while making infrequent visits to Nalanda itself during his nearly decade-long tenure. Consequently, the university struggled to make significant progress during that period. In September 2011, disgusted by Sen's unabashed nepotism in appointing his Marxist cronies at inflated salaries to key positions at Nalanda, Kalam dissociated himself from the project. The CAG, too, disagreed with how schools were being established. The university failed to establish schools in time and could not start the construction of university campus work, the CAG report revealed. In 2021, BJP leader Subramanian Swamy lodged a complaint with the Central Bureau of Investigation, seeking the registration of a corruption case against senior. 
According to Swami, the FIR may be registered on the basis of the CAG audit reports for defalcation and reckless misuse of funds, lack of accountability, criminal breach of trust, criminal misappropriation of public funds, and embezzlement of about 3,000 rupees crore of taxpayers' money. Willful Sabotage It doesn't take rocket science to figure out that Marxists are dead opposed to a revival of Hinduism. Like the Ram Mandir in 2024, Nalanda has the potential to become an iconic destination that contributes to the growth of Indic culture. An experienced economist like Sen would have known that and would have tried everything to kill the project or, at the very least, kill its momentum. It was obvious that Sen wasn't keen on launching Nalanda University as a center of ancient Indian learning. How else can one explain the conspicuous absence of the university's chancellor at the grand reopening of this esteemed institution, an event occurring eight centuries after Nalanda's destruction by Islamic invaders? Some observers believe that the likely poor strength in the classes may have forced Sen to skip the inauguration. But if he claims to be so interested in the post now, one wonders why he did not show this enthusiasm on the inaugural day. To Sen, Nalanda University appeared more as an exotic venture. One might have appreciated it if Amartya had declared that having achieved everything an academician could aspire to, building Nalanda University was his life's mission, and he intended to settle in Bihar for that purpose. Instead, Amartya seemed to view Nalanda University as an opportunity for frequent trips, at the expense of Indian taxpayers, and eloquent speeches. Negationism in Indian History Sen's appointment was controversial from the get-go. His views on the Islamic invasions of India effectively created an intellectual shield for the oppressors. He justified the inherent, barbaric violence and iconoclasm of Muslim invaders as, but this nature is in their blood. According to writer Sandeep Balakrishnan, in the same vein, Amartya Sen's wisdom-laden thesis denies Hindus the right to avenge this unprovoked violence. Sen is part of the group of negationist historians who want to whitewash the crimes of Islamic invaders. This is deeply ironic because they are attempting to create a new narrative that contradicts what Muslim chroniclers and rulers have mentioned in their memoirs. For instance, in the case of Nalanda, the Muslim historian Maulana Minhajuddin, in his Tabaka Tainasiri, has left a detailed account of how Muhammad Bakhtiar Kilji and his fanatic hordes swooped upon the defenseless university and systematically burnt it down to the ground after killing hundreds of Buddhists and Hindu monks. Yet revisionists and negationists like D. N. Ja blame Hindus for this barbaric act. Minhajuddin writes what the Muslim army of Kilji saw after storming Nalanda in 1197 CE, the greater number of inhabitants of that place were Brahmins, and the whole of those Brahmins had their heads shaven, and they were all slain. There were a great number of books there, and when all these books came under the observation of the Muslims, they summoned a number of Hindus that they might give them information respecting the import of those books, but the whole of the Hindus had been killed. On being acquainted, with the contents of the books, it was found that the whole of that fortress and city was a college, and in the Hindu tongue, they call a college Bihar. So, what does Ja say about this episode? In 2004, Ja was the president of the Indian History Congress. In his presidential address, he claimed Hindu fanatics had burnt down Nalanda. A Tibetan tradition has it that the Kalakuri king Karna, 11th century, destroyed many Buddhist temples and monasteries in Magadha, and the Tibetan text Pag Sam John Zong refers to the burning of the library of Nalanda by some Hindu fanatics. However, Sharat Chandra Das, the translator and editor of Pag Sam John Zong, sets out the account of the destruction of Nalanda as given in this text. While a religious sermon was being delivered in the temple that he, Kakuta Siddha, a minister of a king of Magadha, had erected at Nalanda, a few young monks threw washing water at two Trithika beggars. The beggars, being angry, set fire to the three shrines of Dharma Ganja, the Buddhist university of Nalanda, that is, Ratna Sagra, Ratna Ranjaka, including the nine-story building called Ratnadati which contained the library of sacred books. Page 92 Such are the blatant, and amateurish, ways that Marxist historians lie. 
According to Belgian Indologist Konrad Elst, there was no long-standing antagonism between Brahmins and Buddhists, if only because most Buddhist writers were born Brahmins and partook of Brahminical culture. Buddhist institutions in India flourished under Hindu rule for 16 centuries, otherwise there would have been nothing of them left for the Muslim invaders to destroy. By contrast, when Islam appears on the scene, Buddhism disappears, and not on account of two Trithika beggars. Cases of polemics between Buddhists and Brahmins may be cited, as also between different Brahminical schools and different Buddhist sects, but they were only the normal exercise of freedom of opinion. They cannot be equated to the Islamic destruction of Buddhism in Central and South Asia. Conclusion Sen's blatant disregard for the rules is an act of unprecedented audacity, causing the revival project to lose sight of its original noble vision. Following the expiration of his term in July 2015, when the Narendra Modi government showed no inclination to extend his tenure at the university, he resorted to the media, shamelessly claiming political interference in education. However, according to journalist R. Jagannathan, Sen's arguments have no legs. One wonders why he thinks his own appointment as Chancellor of Nalanda University was not political in nature. There is little doubt that Amartya Sen was the intellectual father of many of Sonia Gandhi's social spending schemes. And Sen himself kept making political statements in support of my friend Manmohan Singh, and, famously, said that he would not like to see Modi as Prime Minister. For so political a person to complain about how politicians are meddling with academic institutions is interesting. Sen's casual dismissal of the genocide of Hindus by Muslim invaders shows that he is a trenchant hater of Hindus and, by extension, Indic culture. He was clearly the wrong person for a project aimed at reviving an iconic Dermic institution. His appointment as the Chancellor, a position which he doggedly held on to well into his 80s, will rank as one of the most egregious decisions of the Manmohan Singh Sonia Gandhi government. With their crackpot ideology foundering in a Hindu revival in motion, Marxists are desperate to stay relevant. Lies are the only tools they have. It is up to those who seek the truth to deny the Marxists the space to operate on campuses, in government, and in the workplace.